Live stream is up. There we go. Sergeants, if you can begin your recording. The PC recording is up and going. According to the cloud also. The backup is rolling. Excellent. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council joint hearing of the committees on immigration and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices, as I'm doing. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you uh, to everyone. My name is Carlos Menchaca, and I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. We are joined today by the committee, our co-host committee chair on consumer affairs and business licensing, chaired by my colleague, uh, Council Member and Chair Diana Ayala from the Bronx uh, and Manhattan. Uh, I want to acknowledge some of the members that are here today and uh, Council Member Feliz, Council Member Lander, Council Member Chin, and Council Member Kalos, and Council Member Brannon. We, and as they come on, we will acknowledge them. Today, the committees will be conducting an oversight on the city's efforts to fight fraud that targets our immigrant communities, whether this be immigration services fraud or consumer fraud. But I wanna start with some questions that are gonna hopefully ground us in this discussion that we've been having as a city council in a city for some time. What exactly is fraud? What is the role of our city government, the city council and the city agencies to combat this? How are we measuring success in fighting against fraud? Who is being left out of this work? And does it matter if these are people and New Yorkers and neighbors uh, who are immigrants? Maybe they're undocumented. Maybe they can't vote in our local municipal elections or speak English. These are the things that are framing my head and my discussion as we move through this hearing and hopefully get to some answers about how we can do it better. Three million New Yorkers are immigrants. This should come as to no surprise to anyone. We are a city of immigrants built by immigrants and held together during COVID by immigrants. These same immigrants have disproportionately uh, been impacted by poverty, low education attainment, and low English proficiency, often making them easy targets for bad business actors to exploit. Ultimately, this can result not only in loss of wages and savings, but serious immigration consequences, potentially deportation. COVID-19 has also brought about a host of new emergency relief scams, personal protection equipment, price fixing, and dubious home remedies. The city has a mandate to do everything it can to protect its citizens and its people from scammers. That's why the city council has previously passed legislation to require the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection in consultation with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to provide immigrant New Yorkers with information on consumer protection issues and resources. Legislation to require immigration service providers to include clear language in their contracts that lays out their duties, limitations, and their customers' rights. And legislation that clarified clarifies the role of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection and empowered the agency to identify and penalize deceptive business or trade practices. We are grateful to the administration for testifying and I hope that this hearing is just one of many opportunities we're gonna take advantage of to work together to 
to ensure that our immigrants, those that we engage in our districts and beyond, uh, hear the commitment from the city and the administration to take the allegations that we're going to hear and the exploitations of these uh, scammers seriously and to act swiftly to end such practices. And I want to just bring the work that we've been doing in the council district office in district 38. And I know that uh, Chair Ayala has also been dedicated to the excluded worker fund, a state program that is bring, bringing relief for the first time uh, for so many families uh, who are impacted workers that did not qualify for federal dollars. The scams that we are hearing from people uh, as I answer the phone and talk to people are incredible. We're going to hear from some of that today, but that is just the glimpse of what is happening and how we are going to dedicate time today to understand it. I want to say thank you to my staff uh, who are uh, Chief of Staff Lorena Lucero and Legislative Director Cesar Vargas, also Immigration Committee staff who have been working on this issue, Committee Council Harbania Uja, Policy Analyst Elizabeth Kronk, and uh, I want to hand it over to my co-chair, Councilmember Ayala. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. And I want to recognize that we were we've also been joined by Council Members Koo and Brooks Powers. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, actually. My name is Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to welcome you to our joint hearing today with the Committee on Immigration, chaired by a colleague, uh, my colleague, Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Our hearing today will focus on immigration services and consumer fraud and the steps that the administration has taken to protect immigrant New Yorkers. As consumers, we are all unfortunately at risk of being taken in by scams and frauds. Immigrant New Yorkers, however, are unique in their risk as they face adverse immigration consequences when they fall prey to consumer fraud, in addition to risking their financial security. In the worst cases, this can mean losing their immigration status and facing deportation. In 2017, the council passed local law 63 to regulate immigration services fraud, where providers given, uh, give the permission that they are provided legal, I'm sorry, let me reread that. Cause like in, tw in 2017, the council passed local law 63 to regulate immigration services fraud, where providers give the impression that they are providing legal services. Pursuant to this law, providers are required to inform customers of their rights post uh, signage in English, as well as other languages in which they do business. Importantly, the law also prohibits providers from offering and providing services that show that should only be provided by an attorney and from making statements that could lead a customer to believe that the provider is an attorney or an immigration uh, expert. It is essential that DCWP regulate such providers, but legal services are not the only industry targeting immigrants. For example, a recent scam in New York involved calls leaving voicemails in Mandarin from numbers appearing to originate from mainland China and claims to be made uh, from Ch the Chinese embassy, the Chinese consulate, or Chinese law enforcement agencies. These calls fraudulently claim that personal financial information, such as bank account or credit card information, is necessary to avoid issues with legal status. The COVID-19 pandemic created additional opportunities for scammers to target immigrant New Yorkers. This includes targeting recipients of stimulus checks and immigrant New Yorkers who receive financial relief through the Excluded Workers Fund. In May 2020, DCWP issued a statement decrying the rise in COVID-19 related scams and produced a list of scams targeting New Yorkers to raise awareness for consumers. Clearly, the compreh uh, comprehensive action by the administration is necessary to combat the increase in scams targeting immigrant New Yorkers. And I look forward to hearing from Moya and DCWP today about how they have worked together over the last uh, 18 months to educate and protect immigrant New Yorkers from consumer and immigration services fraud. Before we, be, we begin, I would like to thank uh, my staff, council commi um, committee council, Stephanie Jones, policy analyst, Leah Skripiak and Noah Mixler, as well as my deputy chief of staff, Michelle Cruz, for their work in preparing this hearing. I will now turn it over to uh, committee council, Stephanie Jones, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chairman Chaka and Chair Ayala. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that Council Member Yeager has also joined us. I am Stephanie Jones, Counsel to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I will be moderating this hearing today. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. 
During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists when called to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Carlos Ortiz, Director of Legislative Affairs of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for questions by Michael Tiger, Deputy General Counsel at DCWP, and Ra Raquel Batista, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and Martin Kim, Policy Advisor, also at MOYA. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Administration panelists, please raise your right hands and I will call on each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this, this, these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Batista? I do. Thank you. Director Ortiz? I do. Thank you. Deputy General Counsel Tiger? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Kim? I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Director Ortiz to present his testimony. Good afternoon, Chairs Ayala and Menchaca. I am Carlos Ortiz, Director of Legislative Affairs at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. I'm joined today by Michael Tiger, DCWP's Deputy General Counsel, along with Commissioner Raquel Batista and Martin Kim, Policy Advisor from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. It is a pleasure to testify today on behalf of Commissioner Hash before the committees you each respectively lead. DCWP's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. This of course includes our immigrant communities who serve a fundamental role in the city's economy. They are our small businesses, they are our essential workers, and they are our consumers who supported our city throughout the pandemic and who will help drive our city's economic recovery. Still, Immigrants in our city and across the country have faced distinct challenges over the past few years. The inflammatory policies and rhetoric from the previous president exacerbated longstanding obstacles faced by immigrants, including the confusing and uncertain framework that governs one status in the United States. However, this has not deterred DCWP now or during the darkest days of the past presidential administration from continuing to enforce consumer and worker protections on behalf of all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. Moreover, we have remained committed to bridging historical gaps between city government and our, and our immigrant communities, such as language access, to ensure that information and rights afforded to immigrant New Yorkers are within reach and can help empower these communities. In New York City, DCWP enforces laws and rules regarding immigration service providers, or ISPs. ISPs are those individuals or businesses that charge fees for any kind of immigration related service. ISPs are not lawyers and are typically not accredited or recognized by the United States Department of Justice. Thus, there are limits to the type of assistance that ISPs can provide. ISPs cannot give any legal advice on any immigration matter or represent an individual in court or before the federal government or any other immigration authority. What ISPs can do is provide assistance with translations, type up application forms, and compile or photocopy documents. When engaging with an ISP, there are several protections in place for a consumer. These protections include rights to a written contract that itemizes the services being provided, a receipt that includes the ISP's legal name and address, and the ability to cancel a contract and obtain a refund within three days of entering the contract. Traditionally, DCWP has conducted enforcement of ISPs through various methods, including mediation, routine patrol inspections, or in response to complaints that lead to actions before the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, or in New York State Court. However, changes to the industry, as well as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic have challenged facets of our enforcement. While in prior years, ISPs operated as storefront establishments, in more recent times, our inspectors and advocates have noted that ISPs are operating out of plain sight. They no longer publicize their locations through traditional mediums, and they operate in the back rooms of offices or even private residences, blunting our patrol efforts. 
Operating informally, individuals or businesses acting as ISPs leverage community trusts, kinship, or shared nationalities to connect with consumers, but at the same time continue to violate ISP laws. For example, there is a long-standing issue of individuals or businesses advertising themselves as notarios to scam immigrant consumers. In this context, a person advertising themselves as a notario knows full well that in some Latin American countries, this is a title given to a legal professional. While in the United States, a notary does not necessarily have specialized legal training. In some cases, these entities provide such damaging legal advice that immigrants are placed into deportation proceedings. Other legal ISPs that operate out of plain sight are simply fly-by-night actors that lure in consumers, demand payments, and then disappear shortly thereafter. As we have seen through our consumer protection and licensing enforcement in different industries, fly-by-night actors sign short-term leases, they use fake corporate names, or conduct outreach through informal social media networks that make locating them after a complaint has been filed extremely difficult. Still, DCWP continues to use its civil enforcement authority to bring cases before oath and in New York State Court. Holding unscrupulous businesses accountable is vital to deterring illegal activity. In recent years, DCWP has successfully tried or favorably resolved cases against ISPs, uh, the ISPs A New Beginning for Immigrant Rights, We Throw in Offices, and Mr. Henry's Consulting Service. In these cases, the businesses misrepresented themselves as attorneys, illegally provided legal advice, posted deceptive advertising, and failed to provide accurate contracts and receipts after collecting fees from consumers. In total, we were awarded or have secured more than $237,000 in civil penalties and $34,000 in consumer restitution from these actions. Another key facet of our approach to ISPs has been to proactively educate our communities to prevent fraud from occurring in the first place. Since 2019, we have held more than 310 consumer protection education events where we speak to constituents directly about how they can protect themselves from a fraudulent ISP. This includes joint collaborations with government agencies, such as the New York State Office of New Americans, the Protecting Immigrant New Yorkers Task Force, and the Queensborough President's Immigration Task Force. Our Consumer Bill of Rights on ISPs is available in 13 languages, and we have additional literature with tips available for consumers, such as only going to providers with fixed and physical locations, and not to believe providers that claim special relationships with government entities. Through these educational efforts, our goal is to empower our city's immigrant communities with tools to avoid the exploitative business practices of certain ISPs. And during the question and answer portion of the hearing, Commissioner Bautista can speak more to their agency's outreach and recent ethnic media campaign to warn immigrants of the dangers surrounding immigrant fraud, uh, immigration fraud. Lastly, we would be remiss to not take note of introduction 1622, legislation recently passed by the council and advocated for by this agency that extends greater protections to our immigrant communities. Introduction 1622, the modernization of the city's consumer protection law includes language access requirements for businesses to negotiate certain transactions with consumers. Additionally, additionally, fines for deceptive activity will be adjusted for inflation for the first time since 1969, allowing the CPL to continue to serve as an effective deterrent for illegal business practices, such as those committed by fraudulent ISPs. Protecting our immigrant communities from fraud and supporting their economic success is vital for the city, now more than ever, as we look to a fair recovery for all from the effects of the pandemic. We as a city need to be responsive to our immigrant community's concerns through enforcement, education, and common sense and effective legislation. As always, we value the council as our partner in ensuring that consumer and worker rights remain a priority for the city. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to discussing any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Ortiz. I'd like to also acknowledge Councilor Ramoya has joined us. I will now turn it over to questions from Chairman Chaka. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that and for the for the uh, the testimony. I want to start with some questions to Commissioner Bautista. And uh, welcome, by the way. Thank you for for being here today. And we are really interested to hear a little bit from Moya about your understanding of the prevalence and the type of scams that come to Moya through all the different lines that you have out in the community and relationships. Uh, what has Moya witnessed impact an immigrant community right now? So uh, first, thank you, Kasim Berman Chaka. Um, of course, you know, I'd like to first start uh, saying that we strongly believe that the best way to combat immigration fraud is to provide free trusted legal services through our Action NYC uh, program and other programs that we have. 
um, and to make sure immigrants are aware of the trusted services that are available to them and to combat misinformation with clear, current and timely updates on the changes to the law and policy. Um, in terms of our outreach, um, Moya uh, conducts outreach around the issue of immigration fraud. Uh, we include information about fraud in many of our Know Your Rights presentations provided by our outreach and organizing and community service teams. Um, we also include this information in our curriculum for our Know Your Rights programs and in our public messaging. Um, it also, we um, have a We Speak NYC um, episode that covers legal services, both legitimate and illegitimate um, help, you know, what that looks like. Um, and we also make sure to include um, information on access to free legal services through our Action NYC in almost all of our public messaging. Um, Moya has also recently invested 35,000 in public messaging around fraud in conjunction with Catholic Charities. Um, and we uh, make sure to always work with our Action NYC uh, partners. Um, in terms of when we get reports on issues of fraud, uh, we get a handful of um, fraud complaints through our hotlines. Uh, we have added this as a part of our screening questions for Action NYC um, this year, and we found that about 4% of clients reported a fraud um, from the first half of this year. Um, this is, you know, a, a low number, um, and we think that this is because, um, you know, the administration at the federal level has changed um, and the fraud may be reported uh, to other institutions that's not Moya. Uh, Commissioner, I just on, on that one point, you're saying that from all the calls that are coming in so far this year, is this this calendar year or this fiscal year? So, so if I can chime in here, Chair, thank you for that question. Uh, the 4% the of clients who have reported that in our screening, that's for the first half of this calendar year. Got it. And 4% are, are reporting fraud partly because you have added it to a script when, when people call the line and you're now screening for it. That's that right, right? It, it's, yes. it's a new part of our screening. Got it, okay, and it was just added this year. So I think the other, the other thing that's um, important to say is, or ask is how are you now um, kind of connected to the other agencies and really kind of gathering all the information. Are you a clearinghouse for all the different types of scams? And I'm assuming that some of the scams now that are coming in are uh, connected to the excluded worker fund. So how are, how are you get, gathering all the information? Sure. So, and and so, how many of them came in with uh, excluded worker fund issues? So when we get a phone call of someone being a victim of fraud, you know, first we assess, right, what the situation is, um, and we will connect them uh, to legal services, or we will also refer them to the ONA hotline, um, all depending on what the actual facts are of the case. And when it comes to an issue that's related to a financial issue, we will uh, coordinate with our sister agency, DCWP. Council member, let me add, um, uh, DCWP, you know, we, we receive complaints through a number of different mediums. They, they could be traditional 301 online or through our in-person staff at these outreach events that I was describing where you know, we encourage staff to connect with the constituents directly and offer their information to further on help negotiate or manage a complaint. Um, we, also, we also work closely with government agencies such such as um, the AG's office or local, D, local DA's offices through the Protecting Immigrant New Yorkers Task Force, which also has advocates on it as well. And that is really helpful for us to understand a more of these scams that are arising in their immigrant communities. Um, with respect to this particular issue about the immigrant, uh, about the excluded worker fund, um, we have heard cases of you know, tax preparers charging much higher prices um, um, to, to immigrant consumers. Um, so it is something that we've begun to look more and more into. Um, as, especially as we've taken complaints, um, 
I think something as well that um, we would offer in that situation too, when we connect with consumers is we have a lot of free financial services available through the city, such as our free tax prep uh, centers or our financial empowerment centers, where we would encourage people to go to and meet with a trusted provider, provider or counselor. And, and uh, uh, Director Ortiz, is that how I should uh, address you? You can, you can just call me Carlos, it's fine. Tocayo. Yeah, Tocayo. 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 Um, how, how can we, um, I, I just wanna dig deeper here in this conversation about the Excluded Worker Fund and pull out two things. One is the, is there a price that's okay for charging a New Yorker who's filling out the Excluded Worker Fund? Is, is, is there something that says this is okay, but then this is not okay? What is that line? Is that something that has been developed for the city of New York from you, from your agency and the mayor's office? Thank you, Councilmember. I think typically what we're looking for um, with respect to tax preparers is really deceptive advertising. You know, we don't want people being taken advantage of by bait and switches, for example. So for example, one price listed outside, but once you sit down with that tax preparer, it's a different price inside. So the RCPL does give us a lot of authority to protect against that type of activity. And it's what, you know, it's one of the ways we, we work to help uh, any consumer, but particularly immigrants in this particular context. So there, so is there a acceptable rate of fee for excluded worker fund? I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of a particular rate, sir, but I could definitely look into this and find out more for you about a particular number that they can charge. Okay. Um, and this is, so, so the second part to that is the city has tax preparers that you have on hand that could have been supportive of the excluded worker fund at no charge and funnel people to there. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, that you all did? Did you, did you do any support for excluded worker fund application since you have you know, positive relationships with immigrants? Yeah, uh, yes, Councilman, thank you. I mean, we are extremely proud of our financial empowerment services. It is, it is a key uh, facet of the work that we do here. We conduct, you know, every year, we have an extensive outreach campaign that goes out um, and it's also multi multilingual as well. Um, Cause we, we do believe this is a service that New Yorkers really need to take advantage of um, in, in this context, including excluded workers who for a long time went without support from our federal government. So we are happy with, we, we are always happy to talk about our services and make sure that immigrant New Yorkers utilize them as well. And Chair, if I can, and if I can add to that, I think uh, in the outreach that Moya has done around the Excluded Workers Fund, we've certainly highlighted um, not just the availability of the fund, but the fact that the state has funded community-based organizations within uh, communities in New York City to provide free assistance in application for the Excluded Workers Fund, which is something that we uh, definitely have wanted to highlight. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you've been following that, but a lot of that money came in late. Did, did, did you know that too? Yeah, so th that is part of the conversation um, that we have been having with uh, some of the community partners, because as you know, we have close relationship with those partners, and also something we have raised in discussions that we've had with the New York State Department of Labor. Okay, so I just want to, in this Q&A, and I'm going to, actually, I'm going to pause. I have a lot more questions for Moya, but I want the chair and other members to ask first so they can get their questions out. We can come back and do a deeper dive. But I just wanted to illustrate something that I'm seeing in just in this conversation. Uh, one, uh, just identifying and defining fraud around the excluded worker fund, which is the thing of the moment right now, and not having like a sense of this is okay to charge and this is not okay to charge on hand. One, two, um, understanding that if you were following the excluded worker fund and the support from the state and it was a little bit jumbled and i wasn't very happy with that and i know that organizations were waiting for money it really pushed on us as a district office for example to get out there and do a lot of this support our our district office became an excluded worker fund support team we filled out over 200 applications with a 95 percent approval rate and that's because we have positive relationships with government I haven't heard yet that the city decided to want to take that on and, and utilize that relationship so that people didn't go somewhere else to pay or to be frauded. 
and this is these, these are the questions I was asking at the beginning of this of this hearing what's fraud what's our responsibility if it's a state thing do we not do anything uh but there are people <laughs> they are new yorkers so this I'm, I'm really trying to tease this out what's our responsibility and do we just go come in after the fact um so but i'm going to be following up on on that train of thought when we come back uh, to questions or um or after the other members. I'm gonna hand it over to, oh, right, and if there's any response right now, I, I would appreciate any response to what I'm just laying out in this discussion from Moya or uh, from Carlos. Um, I think that, you know, we would like to hear the other questions, um, but definitely, you know, the issues have been noted and we're happy to continue the conversation to, to talk about the needs and the gaps. Great. And I think what I would just add, yeah. council member, I would just add, council member, it's that you know, we we do take uh, the issues that are affecting our immigrant communities very seriously. You know, throughout the entire pandemic, through all that facets of our work, whether it is workers' rights, consumer protection, or financial services, we, you know, we, we've made sure to to center our immigrant communities in particular. You know, there, there are particular issues that they face, whether it's fear of retaliation, uh, their issues with their status that make cases very sensitive for our communities. Um, so definitely we encourage people to bring complaints towards us. We work with them. And if with our resources, you know, we, we, we try and come to successful outcomes on their behalf for sure. Okay. And again, my point is that we could have, we could have prevented a lot of fraud if we engaged in a very robust engagement process with trusted partners. And uh, knowing that the state was gonna fumble that on the executive side, because we saw that coming. Uh, so, Chair Ayala. Thank you, um, Chairman Chaka. Um, so I think this question would be for DCWP, but do we know what the number of consumer fraud cases reported to the agency is um, for this year? Sorry, I was muted. Um, uh, in terms of complaints, um, we have received about, I think, 27 complaints from uh, constituents this year. That's online with what we usually receive annually regarding immigration service providers. And I think, um, you know, definitely during the initial part of the pandemic, there was a, a dip in complaints, uh, which I think, you know, it makes sense. It, it coincides with the fact that many non-essential businesses have been closed, um, but then we're, we're returning to the norm. Um, with, with how much intake we're, we're receiving. Just to, uh, Chair Ayala, just to clarify your question and uh, my colleague's response, were you, say, were you asking immigration, for, immigration fraud related complaints, ISP related complaints, or all, all consumer protection complaints? Well, well, I actually wanted to know what was the number, the total number of complaints coming into the agency and how many of those complaints, what percentage of those complaints were uh, specifically immigrant focused? I think Carl, Carlos was giving the numbers for the immigration. I mean, I don't have okay. don't have right on hand the total number of complaints we've gotten this calendar year so far. It's many, many, many more than that. Um, but we can get we can get back to you and give you that number in okay. short order. Okay. And um, all right, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it seems like a it seems like a small uh, you know number. Um, we're, we're already you know nearing the end of September. So I, you know, I, I always get kind of concerned, right, that maybe people are making complaints to, a, you know, uh, to other agencies or just, you know, don't really understand who to make the complaint to. Um, is Moya receiving any complaints that then, you know, you're maybe communicate and communicating that information to DCWP? Yes, if, we've. I would. My my instinct would probably be to call you first, right? I mean, most people don't you know they don't know who to call right so unless i'm calling 311 and they're directing me you know uh straight to dcwp you know if i'm an immigrant person and i'm you know the victim of people, probably will call you first so i'm curious about that yes council member Bayala. so at our ask moya hotline our it's a very very low number in 2020 we received one notario fraud inquiry which we referred to dcwp um, and in 2021, the Ask Moya hotline received three notario fraud inquiries, which we referred to our Action NYC program. 
um, due to the fact that it was related to um, immigration related needs and one was referred to the Office of New Americans. But none were referred to DCWP? Um, the one in 2020 was. Okay. Because the ones in 2021 were immigration specific. Okay, okay. Now, when, um, and this is for, for Commissioner Batista, when uh, in your testimony you mentioned, uh, well, actually not in your testimony, but you mentioned um, public messaging being you know, a tool that you use to help educate the community, what do you, how do you define public messaging? What does that look like? Um, it includes, you know, our website, our social media, um, you know, any advertising that we may be doing. Um, and then again, you know, our outreach team and our um, constituent services team also um, gives out the information when they go out to do presentations in the public as well. Is, is any is any of the uh, are any of the agencies um, utilizing text messaging as a as a tool of engaging with um, with communities uh, where where we have especially large pockets of immigrant communities? With respect to uh, DCWP, that um, that's not an outreach tool that we that we use frequently. Um, typically, our presentations are mean to be proactive and interactive. Um, their presentations in, in community centers, their presentations with local CBOs, community-based organizations, or faith-based organizations. Uh, so that's typically how we're reaching uh, our constituencies. No, understood, but I think as we evolve, right, um, there are a variety of tools that we now have uh, that we can utilize to ensure that we're, you know, we're, we're sharing that message um, to as many people as possible in as many different ways as possible. So you know, for me, the more the merrier, um, you know, I, I will be plastering information everywhere, right? Bus stations, um, you know, check cashing places, um, places where I know that, that people frequent because, you know, even though I appreciate and there is a value, right, to having um, resource fairs and having, um, you know, individuals from the agencies come and present at, at different, you know, nonprofit organizations, maybe senior centers, um, not everybody shows up to those events, right? So then I kind of start to freak out a little bit because I'm wondering, well, how are we getting information out to those people that are so busy working, right? That throughout the day that they don't have the time. And, and you know, now we have a flash flood and everybody's phone is beeping, right? Like, like crazy because we're getting that information in real time. Um, whenever there's an emergency, right? We're getting that information in real time. There has to be a way um, to create some sort of messaging, you know, uh, I mean, te the, the technology exists already, right? That's very specific to communities where we're using that as, a, as a, an additional tool, right? In the toolbox to help um, better educate our communities um, so that they know, right? Ahead of time um, and they don't fall prey to, to these type of tactics. Um, now, the pop-up offices, um, Carlos, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of them are like fly by night, you know, offices. Are they usually, is it your experience that they're usually located in communities of color and communities where you have, you know, a larger immigrant, uh, uh, you know, population? Thank you for the question, council member. I think in, in our experience, it, it has been a mixture actually. I mean, sometimes we have them located in, in our in our immigrant communities and sometimes we have them located in in the center of the city of Manhattan particularly in in back office suites um so it is it is a mix in terms of where they are located we, I mean I would imagine that it's challenging right to identify them with enough time to because I'm, I'm I've seen it happen where you know the office is open and then they have like this you know a huge uh, influx of people going in and then all of a sudden they're closed, right? Um, so it, how, how difficult has it proven to identify, you know, the location of these sites and, and catch these bad actors um, before they have an opportunity to, to run? Uh, it, it does prove difficult. I mean, I, I think similarly in, in my community, I see similar pop-up situations happen or you have you have a lot of activity happening in a particular storefront and then the next day it's, it's, it's gone, it feels like. So it, it, that does make it difficult, for example, to patrol or to respond to a complaint. Um, for that reason, we are so proactive in, our, in, our, in, in making sure we're preventing people from going there in the first place through, through our education. Um, and that said, you know, we, when, when we're able to compile enough, en enough facts and, and we have complainants that come before us, we are also able to bring successful actions forward 
Um, and that really, we hope, is able to deter future business activity. Is DCWP working with local bids to better inform them so that they, they're aware, right, as they start to maybe see these pop-up sites come up? We, yes, we, we are in constant communication with bid, with bid associations. Perfect. Um, okay, Do, does anybody know what the number of nonprofit groups is that were um, awarded funding for the excluded workers fund application process? So uh, thank you for that question, Chair. Uh, I believe it was just over 40 in New York City specifically, but uh, we can get back to you with the exact number. And can you also um, make sure to, to highlight where exactly they're located? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Um, that's, that's all from me, uh, Chair Menchaca. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Uh, we have, if other members have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, we have Councilmember Chin. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you to the co-chairs. Um, you know, the thing with the scam, even us, with the Asian last name, my staff, we get calls in Mandarin you know, telling us that this and that, or the council is calling, it's it just so rampant. Um, and people really don't know where to complain. Like, and, and how do you complain about those? And I think people know to hang up and, and not answer. And there's been public education uh, about that. One of my question is that, you know, we do a lot of these outreach events, but the, the utilization of the traditional Ethnic media, I think is really critical. There's so many radio station, television station, newspaper, community newspaper. I wanna see like how Moya and, and DCWP really utilize those to get the word out, but not just, you know, some pay advertisement would be helpful to support these media. Other thing is that to really write stories about how some cases were reported and got resolved and people got compensated. I think people need to read about those story to see that it's, it's good to report or there is a way for them to complain. Um, the other thing, the third thing that is, is the proactive approach is really like, I know um, Director Ortiz talked about, you know, DCWP used to like scan, you know, look at advertisement and things like that uh, to see where these people are. And I think that is still, needed to be done. I mean, they're still advertising, but that's how um, the community find out about it. And my last point is the service providers um, that the chairperson also talked about, they charge money for filing taxes, for filling out housing application, for getting you on a waiting list. And they charge hundreds of, you know, hundreds of dollars just to help somebody fill out, oh, whether it's an SSI or disability. And are these service provider agency, are they licensed? I mean, are we are able to regulate the amount of money they charge? I mean, this is rampant. I mean, but it's by word of mouth and we hear about it. And oftentimes people are willing to pay because they can't get the service through the government agency or like the CBOs are like overutilized and or they're not close, you know, as far from their home. And they, so they, they take, they utilize these services and they pay out so much money to just to fill an application that could have been done for free. Uh, so I think those are the things that we really have to uh, continue to look at because it's not easy for every community to file a complaint. And that's why the complaints are so low. I mean, even you call the hotline, you gotta get through the English first to, to press the button for Chinese or Spanish. And so people sort of like, don't bother. But you hear it through the community. You know, you hear people talking about, you know, their neighbor or their relative have to pay so much money. And so I think if we can take a more proactive approach to really like seek out these, you know, service providers and making sure that they don't overcharge to do their service and make sure people know that there are success if you file a complaint, you could get it resolved. And they need to hear about those stories. Just like we get, we get stories, you know, from the civilian review board or the conflict of interest board. You know, they they send us story, 
So I think that's something that we could be more proactive on. Thank you. So CCWP, like on these service providers, are they being licensed? Like these people who help people fill out application. Um, are you aware of these groups? We're, we're definitely, I mean, I would say definitely, um, we have heard reports about these groups that are, are helping, or, or I should say, they're bringing in folks with respect to the excluded uh, worker fund and are charging higher prices. I don't believe that these are, these will be licensed entities. Um, Mike, am I correct in that? No, I mean, you know, of course, the, you know, council passed an amendment in 2017 to our immigration service provider law that our agency enforces, uh, which has a lot of strict regulations about what immigration service providers can do. It doesn't set rates, uh, but it prohibits, for example, charging for forms that are free through the government. Um, but that's not a licensing scheme. Uh, but it, there is a series of regulations in Title 20, which is uh, DCWP is part of the administrative code that sets forth regulations for immigration service providers. But I think that it's got to go beyond that. I know that, you know, there's been great work done on that and it's been really helpful because I think that's how it started, that people were being charged so much money uh, on application that weren't even done by attorneys. But right now people are being taken advantage of by, you know, tax, filling out, tax form, filling out these service, you know, free application that they should be getting it for free. And they're being charged hundreds of dollars um, to get these applications filled out. So DCWP should really look at your rules and see if you can expand, you know, the regulation to cover, you know, some of these agencies. I'm not against people being creative and providing jobs and, you know, working for themselves, but they should not be taking advantage of people who, you know, are immigrants. Do we need to pass legislation on that? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you came up with some really good ideas, uh, Councilmember Chin, on maybe expanding. If they can't do it right now with regulation, maybe we pass a bill that gives them uh, the ability to regulate further with rates, setting rates uh, on mm. applications that are connected to government. Yeah. And okay. I mean, that's a. I mean, I, I don't know if we can answer that on our side. Can can the bills that are currently in motion mm. and uh, do, can they cover rates and further regulation of, of anyone that's helping somebody fill out a government application? Can also, uh, Commissioner, from oh, Moya, yes. Moya Commissioner, Hi. As, answer the question about really utilizing ethnic media? Yes, um, absolutely. So we at Moya, we send resources to community and ethnic media on a regular basis um, over email. Uh, we're happy to uh, collaborate with uh, DCWP in putting together an anti-fraud roundtable with our community and ethnic media partners. Um, and, you know, we have a robust network of community and ethnic media representing all boroughs and many languages and would be happy to do so. And, and yeah, I think it's, you got to be, pro you know, really more proactive on that because you know, but also I know that the, the, the mayor has dedicated a certain amount of funding for ethnic media, which is great. Uh, so I think that they could be really a great resource, just even for people to read about story or hear about it on the radio. That really makes a big difference because that's what a lot of the immigrant community rely on is the ethnic media. Um, and we really got to utilize them more and really, you know, partner with them but also providing some financial support through advertisement and things like that. Council member, if I could just uh, add or compliment some uh, the commissioner's uh, answer. Um, and we, we also actively use ethnic media radio spots um, to help reach our communities as well. And you will also frequently see in multiple languages, our advertisements in bus shelters, on subway squares, um, and they particularly overlap with you know, the communities that are highest need to use, for example, our free financial services or, you know, could be connected um, with our worker protection folks here at DCWP. And, and just to add one last thing, uh, the commissioner mentioned the $35,000 allocation that Moya provided. That was exactly for a five-week community and ethnic media campaign about mm -hmm. 
uh, immigration fraud risks, especially at a time, this was in June of this year, when uh, there was increasing buzz around possible immigration reform, and we were seeing a possible uptick in uh, fraud in this area. Yeah, I mean, that happened in the past when people heard about amnesty and then all of a sudden, you know, everybody was filling out like applications and charging huge amount of money. So I'm and glad we grew more proactive on that. And I just want to get a clar clarity on that. It's $35,000 for ethnic media, for ethnic media. What was it $35,000 for? I just saw one uh, second. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so it, it was specifically in partnership with Catholic Charities. It was an ethnic um, community and ethnic media campaign included, I believe, paid advertisements. But um, it, there was also, in addition to the media campaign, the funds also supported additional staff at the hotline because we knew at the Action NYC hotline because we knew we would get increased call volume around the, uh, the, this campaign. Got it. And, and so curious, what does $35,000 get, get us in this, in this kind of effort? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, you know, I don't have the exact breakdown in terms of what the budget was in front of me, but uh, we can kind of circle back with our folks and get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, I, again, this is, this, is, this is to Councilmember Chin's question about mm -hmm. how much are we investing in this larger communication through channels that we know get to our immigrant communities and this has been a longer question and i know the mayor has really tried to get there in terms of putting funding toward it but thirty five thousand dollars doesn't seem like a lot uh, especially when we have a lot of different communities with different languages and newspapers and etc we've had conversations in the past about big a big chunk of it goes to Spanish speaking, but we have we have immigrants in the API community with multiple dialects that often feel neglected from this kind of uh, resource. So um, doesn't sound like you have that information, but I think I'm going to make an assumption here that it didn't go far uh, enough to to make to make impact. And but that that's a that's an assumption I'm making right now based on that number, $35,000. Um, if you don't have a response to that, I want to go back to and connect some of the some of the topics that uh, Councilmember Chin brought up in terms of how, how we're responding to these and the stories that we can be collecting. What are the good stories that are connected to Moya and to um, uh, to consumer affairs about the stuff that you've done yourself. I've heard a couple things that get pushed to ONA um, or other agencies, but what, what have you all done in terms of combating, like literally fixing a case? Uh, and I think there's a restitution number. If I can get those numbers, I think there's like a $34,000 restitution where you were able to get money back into the hands of immigrants. Can you walk through what, what, have, you, what, what have you done? Thank you, council member. I'm a, as I mentioned, we did have a number of recent successful actions um, at oath and, and we have uh, ongoing actions as well that we're investigating following complaints. And, uh, but let me defer over here to my colleague, Michael Tiger to describe some of the details of each of those cases. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chaka. I mean, obviously we can give you as much detail as uh, you would like on uh, individual cases, um, but- Give me some you, of the highlight, the best ones that you have. Yeah, I mean, the uh, case, um, one case that where we were able to obtain restitution in a case we resolved that we first brought an oath and then brought a separate act, a complementary action in state court uh, as referred to in uh, Carlos's testimony against the Buatron offices, um, who was an immigration service provider who was targeting the Ecuadorian community. And there were certain consumers that came, did, fi did file a complaint with us. Uh, we talked to them, we developed their story and that we were able to create a compelling enough narrative that we were able to file a compelling um, case and oath and then later in state court. And that resulted in a resolution we were able to get uh, tens of thousands of dollars back for that uh, consumer. Um, I mean, we, 
Also, complaints come into our consumer services division, which is the division within the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection that has the clearinghouse for all types of complaints that come in through the agency from the consumer perspective. Um, and then we will try when we can to mediate those complaints. And I know in 2021, there's at least one instance of RA being able to successfully resolve a case at the mediation stage um, for a consumer. Um, and then some of the other cases that we have brought, we have seen some of the things that you are very familiar with and other members of the committee are very familiar with people, um, providers um, pretending to be lawyers when they're not or uh, making representations to the federal government without notifying the person that's retained them or not giving them the documents that either, either the immigrant is given the, the consumer right. documents. So we're definitely familiar so with the, the usual, the, the, the array of, of uh, complaints that you're familiar with. Um, and, and, and when we get, I'm so sorry, go ahead, Chairman. I'm sorry. But yeah, how, what, what was the resolution? Of which, of which one? So, I mean, uh, so, one of those. so we brought, you know, we brought a case at oath, as I said, um, um, and in state court against the Buitron offices and referred to in Carlos's testimony that we were able to resolve favorably. Um, we had a case at oath um, against a notario that was advertising on YouTube, a really nefarious product called ID for ICE. That's hmm. yes, that where he was advertising on his YouTube channel that if you purchase this card from him, that that would be a get out of jail free card. Now, this was at the time of the, at the time, it was at the height of the, um, the prior presidential administration and their actions against uh, vulnerable immigrant communities. Uh, and so we brought a case that oh, got us went to trial, had a successful okay. trial. I can't talk much more detail about that because that's actually on appeal. Um, so in, still, in, it's still in motion with well, yeah, because we got a successful trial, but they're allowed to then appeal through the state court system, and that's going up through the system, as I'm sure you're familiar with. Sometimes um, the wheels of justice can take uh, years as, as the appellate process uh, grinds on. It's, how many how many cases like that are in motion right now? Are you are you in court for dozens of of New Yorkers right now? In this, just like taking that that case and. Um, we're, we're always looking for, you know, immigrant fraud is definitely part of our portfolio of things we care deeply about. Um, as Carlos alluded to in his testimony, and I think was elicited by Chair Ayala, you know, we haven't got dozens and dozens and dozens of complaints at any given time. But it's, we're always on the lookout for consumers that we can help that have a good narrative that, and clear and violations of either the immigration service provider law or the consumer protection law, which is our broader consumer protection statute that we can that we use to remedy all sorts of harm. But as uh, Carlos alluded to in his, I believe in his testimony, we have several open investigations right now. I can't talk about those in detail uh, because they're open investigations, but at any given time, we are, we are looking at um, these types of harms and seeing if we can help consumers when the complaints do go through the process. Okay. Council member, if, if I can add a, a piece here as well, that, you know, this experience that we have um, through these actions that we're bringing forth or over here from advocates also informs, you know, legislative recommendations that we have made in the past and that we could talk about particularly instruction 1622, which has new language protections in place for immigrants uh, that has increased um, uh, penalties that adjust for inflation. But, you know, we hope that that makes sure that that'll make sure that that businesses don't feel that they can harm consumers and get away with it. Or if they get caught, it's a cost of doing business, which is really pre preventative for deterrence. Yeah, um, that's a, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and the, the last piece I wanted to mention was, you know, recent legislation that we've worked to ensure that in all of our laws and rules, we're able to seek restitution for our consumers. So that's, uh, so that's part of making people all, whole. All of what? In, sorry, I don't know if I'm breaking up. In, in all of our laws and rules that we can seek restitution for consumers. Um, so you're, you're just you're just speaking to the power you have. Well, we've to what we've changed recently um, to address what we've been seeing through our, our actions that we brought forth. You know, it's something I was alluded to earlier, like licensing is um, uh, as, as an option, you know, that we don't always see licensing necessarily as, as a panacea for some endemic issues, particularly if a business is purposely, they're always going to be trying to do something illegal. You know, these fly by night operators are always trying to, to operate under the, the legal thresholds. But when we when we talk about increased fines, you know, that's something that we hope can, can deter business activity as well. Yeah, I mean, to, to sort of use uh, Carlos's answer as a springboard chair, Menchaca, you know, it's, 
we bring these cases and we're able to identify like how can we better enforce these cases and we've been we've been so heartened to have the council as a partner to sort of pass better laws i mean uh carlos allude to intro 1622 which is council member chin's bill that the council just voted on last last month and it's going to be very important it raises penalties that had not been updated since 1969 it has um, provisions specific to immigrant communities. And we think it's going to be very important going forward um, to use that as a tool, along with the immigration service provider law um, that I referenced earlier in response to Council Member Chin's question. So we're always looking at when we take these cases, like how can we uh, enforce these better? And we like when we you know, think it's important to have this partnership with the council to uh, make our enforcement power stronger to help all New Yorkers and especially this vulnerable community. Okay, I, I, and I get that. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm now looking less for intention because I, I hear a lot of intention of like, this is what you want to do. I really want to get to numbers and understanding what, what, what has happened so that we can see and measure stuff, whether it's happening and how effective it's been. That's, I think that's my goal of the, of the next questions. And I, I want to remind members if you want to have if you have questions, um, raise your hand. But I think what what I want to follow up with what Carlos said in terms of of the fines going up. Has that happened? Have you increased fines? No, it's not effective yet, Chairman Chaka. It hasn't even lapsed into law, and then it'll be an effective date of 120 days after that. So it'll be early 2022 when the fines will be increased. Early 2022. Okay. So the current system uh, and rubric of fines, how many fines have you collected? And I think that number was given earlier, but I didn't catch it. What have you collected around immigrant fraud fines thus far? I'm not sure, uh, Carlos, do, I mean, yeah. are you provided in the testimony yes. uh, the totals for the four cases that we brought at either oath or in state court? Um, I don't know if that includes um, ISP violations from our enforcement division. Yes, that was, that's correct, Mike. Um, uh, the number that I provided were for these four most uh, recent and notable cases. I believe it was 234,000 civil penalties and about 34,000 in restitution that we sought to secure. 234 violations were issued. $234,000 in civil penalties. $234,000 in civil penalties. From, yes, those four, from those four biggest cases that our lawyers brought either at oath or in state court. Those are connected to four cases. Okay, yeah. I just wanna, I, I don't know if I'm like not understanding this correctly, but from all the work that you're doing, you're bringing case, four cases that have 200, 234,000 in civil penalties and $34,000 in restitution. And I feel like it's, it's so, um, now correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it just feels a little bit lopsided in terms of what we're actually doing as a city to combat this. When we look at the numbers, the number of cases, how many cases are you, are you, are you taking to court? How many, how many people are getting fined? How much money are we, are we taking from folks? Now that's gonna go up, I get it. But just now what we've done, that seems proactive. When council member Chen is saying we want good stories, it doesn't seem to be many stories we can point to. And then this is not only frustrating, it just feels um, like we're, it's passive. We're, we're putting money out there for, for uh, ethnic media to, to signal, but we're just kind of waiting. And, and I have some more questions about other data, but I, am, I, am I not seeing this correctly well, or? Well, Chairman Chaka, I just wanted to reiterate something I think that the commissioner had mentioned at the start in terms of how we see the problem. I think uh, one of the when we're talking of yeah when when we're talking about the problem, I think our goal is always actually to uh, provide for prophylactic measures, right? Because the sense from uh, from us is actually that we don't want to be in a position where fraud has occurred and then it's a matter of how do we help people after the fact. Uh, from our okay. perspective, I think it is most important, right, to uh, provide uh, crucially needed immigration legal services and uh, the information that the community needs in order to seek the right kind of help from the right kind of 
um, service providers. Uh, so when we're talking about numbers, I think the numbers we would point to and talk about in our success stories are the numbers related to Action NYC intakes and screenings, right? Over 9,000 screenings in calendar year uh, 2020. Um, the rates of uh, successful cases, which was, I believe, over 97% in 2020. Uh, those are, uh, yeah, like from Moya's perspective, the way we see the issue is um, when we are always looking to kind of make sure the services are provided so people don't have to seek out uh, and aren't in a position where they're uh, necessarily having to seek services from unscrupulous providers. I think Commissioner wanted to say something as well. I thank you. So yes, I think that um, you know we can absolutely follow up um, on this for you. Uh, we can come back to you with a detailed budget about high, you know, the high level issues, the thirty five thousand that was allocated towards the production of the multilingual ads, the social media, and our media buys. All of our marketing strategies are informed by research and best practices for how to effectively reach immigrant audiences. Uh, we also have a number of learning uh, learnings from the implementation of a number of public awareness campaigns from the public charge to the support not fear to IDNYC. So we're happy to further discuss this issue with you. Okay. Um... Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I again, I, I, I'm still not clear about the, uh, I think um, uh, Martin talked about the prophylactic response that would prevent fraud. And, and what I'm hearing is Action NYC. So help me fill this out. Action NYC, getting people lawyers. Uh, and I'm assuming you're, you're going to, we're paying lawyer, we're paying lawyers to help them fill out forms or we're, we're paying lawyers to help them after they've been frauded, question mark, to working with ethnic media to get the word out about, about fraud and, and don't get, don't be frauded. Uh, is, is that what we're talking about with the prophylactic responses? Um, yeah. I Go ahead, Commissioner, sorry. Oh. Very much. Um, yes, so we've been working through our Action NYC partners. So when there is um, a fraud issue that comes up that's immigration legal services specific, um, we do work with our Action NYC attorneys to help address that. Um, and if for some reason, you know, it falls outside of that scope, that's when we do our referrals to ONA. And then uh, in and what, what would what would constitute an out of bounds for Moya to take the case on? Martin? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, what the commissioner is referring to is when, for example, you had mentioned like fraud related to consumer fraud, right? When there's like a immigration law specific uh, issue related, yeah, immigration related fraud, that's something that our Action NYC providers could handle. But when we're talking about like, Someone has been, um, like we mentioned the COVID scams, right? Those are something we would refer to the Office of New Americans hotline. And it's important to note that- That's a state, that's a state program. Say that again? That's the state line. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of the partners. And uh, as I was going to say, one of the reasons we do refer to, uh, yes, the state Office of New Americans hotline is because uh, they are very well positioned to collect facts and then refer, if necessary, to state actors, right? Depending on what we're talking about, if it's a criminal case, um, I might go to the district attorneys. There might be some instances when the New York State Attorney General might be involved. Referrals also go to DCWP, depending on, um, you know, the specifics of the case. Uh, so, so a lot of that can be routed through um, the Office of New Americans. Okay, um, I haven't heard anything about uh, putting Action NYC in front of people to fill out the X Y Z form. Uh, these are the things that people are being frauded by, right? So we heard from Margaret Chin, from all of us, that this is where people are getting frauded, and all I heard right at this point is not prophylactic. It's, it's in response. This is kind of 
taking care of the symptoms. Give me an example of how we're being getting in front of it, not not passive stuff like social media and that kind of thing, but getting in front of it so people do not fall into an notario situation that's fraudulent. Well, sure. Sorry, Commissioner, please go ahead first. Yeah, so, um, you know, through our Know Your Rights campaign, um, we are being proactive in terms of getting the message out into the community um, and educating people on what are the rights when it comes to an issue of fraud and how to identify fraud. You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, we talked about how we have We Speak NYC. We have a video that um, speaks directly to this issue um, that we also put out into the community. And so, you know, we have been, you know, proactively working to getting the information out into the community. And I'll pass it on to Martin as well, if you'd like to add anything. Right, because I think, um, yeah, thank you for that question, Chair. I, I'm hearing what sounds like a desire to use Action NYC providers for a, a host of a variety of other things, including like application assistance for state programs. I mean, I think uh, one thing to note, obviously, is as for the commissioner program, mentioned, any government, any you know, I, you know the fraud stuff, right? So we know what the fraud is, and we can we can kind of short circuit the notario and help our. This is what we're doing in our district offices, but we only have so much capacity, right? So this is a city agency, you're thinking about citywide stuff, you're seeing trends, uh, you may be collecting data about what this is. And, and this is what I'm trying to get to the point. And, and maybe the point is just made that you're not doing it and that's that's okay and we can move on. But but that's just how I'm feeling right now about, about where the Q&A is going. And, and really there's, there's no, so this is not me asking you to, I mean, maybe it is me asking you to do that, but it's not something you do right now. And that there is no, uh, I mean, know your rights. I, I would maybe think about that as like community education and empowerment, and that's good. Uh, but if you don't change the other component, which is who's filling out these forms and how are they charging people? And if people are calling hotlines and asking for that support, and they're not getting it, then we're, not, we're missing right. that big part of the fraud cycle. Right. And I, I think, um, thank you, Chair. I think that is definitely something, um, you know, Moya uh, has thought deeply about in terms of how to make sure that we're having trusted providers provide these kinds of services. And as you know, with like a host of our programs, including the funds that we have been running dur during the pandemic to, uh, you know, to serve undocumented immigrant New Yorkers, this was work that we did through funding and working with our CBO partners. And part of the reason we do that is because we know that there are some populations and communities that are more comfortable working with these trusted providers, right? That's the model also that we use in the Action NYC setting uh, to, to you know, provide these services. So it's not always the case, I think, that it is, um, uh, you know, the most effective, right? To have Moya yeah. doing direct intake or direct provisions uh, in this uh, case. Uh, yeah, Moya has the Action NYC uh, uh, design for application support. Excuse me. Can you repeat that again, council member? Yeah, uh, are any of the contracts that you have right now connected to Action NYC and, and their design of those contracts through Action NYC through the trusted partners have reimbursement for application support. So allowing for, for folks to, to be able to fill out housing applications and scooter worker fund and whatever they bring to that lawyer. So, so yes, actually. So, um, you know, when we were working with our partners on the OSF fund, right, one of the uh, responsibilities and one of what was kind of built into that contracting model was a recognition that in some cases we wanted them to do warm referrals and help out with application assistance for different programs that uh, someone coming in the door might be um, might be eligible for. So this is a model that we have used, uh, yes, in the past and and continue to use in some contexts. Okay, let's let's move on. I think I think I've kind of circled enough here on this point. Um, I want to get to data. Uh, so does DCWP track 
complaints about scams and fraud. And I'm looking for like specifics here. Uh, do you have any data that you can share today about what those scams are? Who are they targeting? Thinking about language specific uh, communities. So what kind of languages are being, are being targeted? Do you have that data? Thank you, Council Member. I'm, uh, with respect, so with respect to complaints that we, re we receive an input, you know, those, these are tracked by a particular category that's assigned to them. So in preparation for the hearing about immigration uh, fraud, we, we looked into our, the ISP related complaints we received. And I believe that number should be about 115 ISP complaints received in the past few years. Um, but I, I'd have to look, I'd have to dive into, this, into, the, into the data itself to, to parse out the specific languages that consumers were reporting in. Is that something like what information do you get? So what what are you going to dive into? What what information do you have? So in terms of like, oh, I, I mean, in, I mean, this is over, over the course of 115 complaints. You know, what we usually ask for is, you know, we want details of, of what what allegedly occurred. We want we need business names and business addresses and contact information. Sometimes during the course of mediation, we, we will request additional documents. Um, and then our consumer services representatives will work directly with um, the complainant to, to bring a successful mediation, or in other cases, we have to bring an action or, or a patrol inspection to, to verify what's happening out there. So we have narratives in our system about what each complaint is about. As far as objective coding, that will get that'll allow you to just pull out like these are the ones that change that's it's not set that way because we get tens of thousands of complaints a year across our entire portfolio remember we license over 50 business categories we enforce the consumer protection law which applies to every business in the city so the code the objective code that we can use that we can easily extract data is the immigration service provider code but as carla said um, we can provide more detailed data by going into the actual individual records, but that would take an effort to go into the individual data. Got it. it sounds like we could uh, change that so that we can understand what is coming in instead of narratives. It just seems very uh, clunky and it's going to be hard to measure. And because we do not take, because we have people, we're not taking their immigration status. And so we can take other information like what language they prefer, and that helps us understand. So it, uh, that's just a, a note here and a flag for us to fix because it doesn't sound like you're going to be able to have the, the the kind of bandwidth to kind of go through all the different complaints quickly to take to take um, data and understand how we can measure success around this, and that keeps us passive, I think, um, and. And I don't know if, if uh, uh, Councilmember Chin has a follow-up on this area, so I'll pause my, my questions and hand it over to Councilmember Chin. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Just on that, I, if the agency, uh, Moya and DCWB, if you could track the language, wouldn't that help you in terms of like where to focus? I mean, if there, if there are some immigrant community that are not complaining, wouldn't that kind of help you sort of like be more proactive in those community? I mean, I think that that's some really, that there are some really important statistics um, to, to sort of help you target community, um, you know, with, with your, what information you have to offer. Yes, Councilor, I think um, for that, when we're thinking about targeting communities, we definitely want to make sure that we have our information accessible to them. And for that reason, we, you know, we translate our, our bill of rights for consumers that utilize these businesses into 13 languages. You know, when, when, we, when we go out on outreach events, we, we have a number of different uh, stakeholders which we partner with to work in different communities that they represent. So I think that's, it's a very, it's a great point of how we, how we work uh, collaboratively. Also with Moya, Moya does connect us with a lot of folks as well to make sure that, that whether it's a, a remote outreach event that has a, a large spread whether it's an in-person event that we're, we're connecting in the right way. Yeah, but I'm just saying that it's just like collecting the language from complainants. And oh, also I think, yeah, yeah I think yeah. that that's important to help you when you know like certain groups are not complaining. And also you can work with Moya. I remember one of the previous hearings that we had. I mean, Moya also have the capacity, they work with groups that 
language, their language is not translated because they're like smaller, you know, cultural group that the city might not be that familiar with. And, you know, 13 languages is nothing compared to the amount of the different languages that are being spoken in the city, right? So I think like by working, the two agencies working together uh, and then collecting some of this data that can help inform you, like where to put more resource, where to target, um, that, that definitely would be useful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. I mean, that, that these are all great points and, and certainly our collaboration with Moya is fundamental to, to reaching out to these immigrant communities. Well, let's maybe talk a little, thank you, uh, Council Member Chen. I, let's talk about Moya and how they target language uh, through your intake, not necessarily DCWP, but um, Moya, do you take in data that is related to language and other other things that can help uh, understand your um, your intake? Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Chair. We do, um, uh, both in our Moya hotline and in the variety of services that we provide. We track language. Okay, and do you, do you have any report about what what high high language what languages are coming in at higher rates? Uh, we do have that information, especially for the hotline. I, I don't have that information with us currently. Um, I will note that when it comes to fraud complaints specifically, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, we're talking about a uh, very small number of complaints. Um, so uh, when it comes to those complaints specifically, um, uh, you know, it, it's unclear whether that's like a trend or, or you know, just, um, uh, just a few isolated instances where we get the call. Okay, so we'd like to see that data. Um, and, and really what I wanna lift up right now is something we just keep hearing over. And I mentioned this earlier today that the AAPI community often feels disconnected from the resources, from targeting, from attention. How is Moya solving that? This is not the first time you've heard this uh, around scams and fraud. So, sorry, Commissioner, you're about to-, to No, go ahead. Sure, I, I was just going to say specifically, I know, um, there was uh, mention of the Chinese phone scam. And uh, I know that in that instance in particular, we had actually heard a lot of reports from the community. Um, as Council Member Chin mentioned, uh, we, we as staff members were also getting those calls. And that was an instance in which we really worked with our community partners to do engagement. We did citywide engagements in February of 2019 around this issue and around Lunar New Year specifically uh, about the scam. We spoke with and shared information at a convening of citywide Chinese speaking organizations and partners. Uh, and there was also coordination with the Consulate General of uh, the People's Republic of China in New York all around the scam. So I think that's just one example of where when we do hear kind of concerns uplifted from this community that we take steps to address and uh, target kind of our response. Okay, so I think what, what I wanna kind of get a sense of now kind of switching to these partners that we have that are state and federal, what is Moya planning and uh, with strategy, and maybe this is with DCWP, to collaborate with state and federal officials around scam and consumer fraud uh, that are directly targeting immigrants? Any plans? What's your work around very specific state and federal partnerships? Not just, hey, what's, let's do a referral, but I'm talking about strategy to combat this. So as you know, we are part of a partnership um, with several of our um, New York State, New York City partners. That includes the New York State Attorney General's Office, the NYPD, the District Attorneys, and of course, the DCWP and um, us at Moya are a part of this um, collaborative. And so you know, we continue uh, doing this work. We actually organized an anti-fraud uh, public um, meeting back in uh, 2019 
Um, so we do have um, this task force that we've been working together for quite a while to address this issue. And you know, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Carlos Ortiz. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes, I think uh, along those lines, we, we are we work with the same partners, whether that's some uh, these task forces that I've been referencing. Um, we also work with you know fellow enforcement agencies. Um, we make referrals to uh, the Queen's DA's office, um, or, or we make referrals to AG's offices in other, in other particular industries. Uh, I think in terms of proactive measures, I mean, I, I was I was we were happy to hear that folks were talking about you know the information we've been putting out there regarding these scams, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and, and, and like, this is the type of work we're constantly doing to, and always readjusting our talking points, readjusting our education to be responsive to what's happening in a particular moment. Um, and so, for example, in this upcoming, this upcoming couple of months, you know, we're talking a lot about pre-tax prep. We're talking a lot about financial empowerment, um, and, and ways people can use these free resources to start helping to build their, their financial stability. Well, I think my, my next question is really about then what do we, how do we solve these things through legislative uh, ways and legislative ways? And I think we've already come up with a couple uh, with a collective council member uh, um, hive mind to, to give you more ability to focus and, and have power to regulate. And, and I know that you said regulation is not necessarily the way to go, but we're also kind of pointing to the fact that that there's a lot of holes in your um, data capture and moving from narrative to real scientific measurement about where things are coming from in a community that is hard to reach and also hard to connect to government in the first place. Uh, I'm kind of seeing really low numbers of engagement around fraud that people might not even know that they're being frauded if, if they're getting charged money and um, fees to, to fill out government applications that should be free. Uh, and then also really not understanding exactly how the contracts that are action NYC related or others that they can actually do a very targeted um, campaign for even state programs because they're still our city, they're still city employees. Um, and the $15,000 that, that some individuals are getting right now are um, they're, they're getting charged a lot of money. Some people are getting charged hundreds and thousands of dollars to get those 15,000, but we aren't, we're only getting that anecdotally. They don't even know that that's illegal. So again, I'm just, I'm just really kind of painting the picture here that this is, um, this is really hard to, to understand. And uh, there's just a lot of holes here that we need to fix. So are there any other legislative ideas that you have constructed thus far that we can learn about so as legislators, we can move and work with our legislative partners up in the state and federal government. Uh, I'm, thank you, Council Member, if I, if I could uh, jump in. Um, I think first, I, I didn't say that, you know, we didn't think regulation would be helpful. I'd say we are very appreciative of what Council is doing to already strengthen our hands in some of these cases. And, and the regulation is part of, you know, that's the authority that we have to protect consumers, protect workers. I think what I was specifically mentioning is a is a type of regulation, which is licensing, which I think in particular, this is, that is not, uh, I don't think by itself, you know, always gonna be an answer to any particular issue. Um, uh, now, I think as Mike uh, pointed out earlier, protecting immigrants, protecting immigrants from this type of fraud is part of our work that we take very seriously um, uh, and that we work intensively to get done. You know, that's developing, developing facts, uh, um, that's working with uh, complainants, you know, to help make sure that they had the strongest case that we put forward for them. Um, and in terms of future legislation, that's something that we're, we're always happy to work with both committees, uh, with, with you, Chair, and with you, Chair, uh, Chairman Chaka and Chair Ayala, to put really common sense and effective measures forward. Yes, and Moya will, you know, of course, continue to work with DCWP to share information about the various topics, including fraud and consumer rights. And we'll make sure to continue doing that in the future. Um, and we also feel that the best way to combat fraud is to provide immigration legal services. So, you know, we're open to uh, further discussion. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Well, I think I think we were able to get as much as we could from from these questions and in the partnership and identified some some uh, areas of opportunity uh, to really focus and think how we capture data, how we measure our own success, how we create more preventative measures. Part of that is literally just going and supporting our communities to fill out applications to remove the role of notarios. Um, I think I like to live in a world where uh, an immigrant doesn't have to go to a storefront pop-up and get services about a city program to apply uh, because they can't speak English. And, and th that's just like, that, that's, a, that's a strategy and prioritization and, um, and that's just, that's leadership. So I, I hope that we can change that with all of us here on this call and, and um, the future leaders that are coming to the council and to the mayor's office. So I think I'm done, Chair Ayala. I don't know if you have any kind of final, final questions or thoughts before we head over to the next part. I have no further questions, thank you. Okay. Um, we're done, I'll hand it over to the council. Thank you for being here today. And thank you for all the members. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. We'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Polly Hardio to testify first, followed by Chioma Asi and then Ulysses Noboa. Polly? Time starts now. Chairs Menchaca, Ayala, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about combating immigration services fraud. My name is Polly Hardio and I'm a senior staff attorney with the Immigration Protection Unit of the New York Legal Assistance Group also known as NILAG. And I work with the Action NYC program in partnership with the Arab American Association of New York, also called AAA. AAA is a community-based organization in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, that supports and empowers the Arab American immigrant community by providing a range of services, including legal immigration services through Action NYC to foster greater understanding of Arab culture and immigrant issues. Likewise, NILAG is a leading civil legal service organization combating economic, racial, and social injustice by advocating for people experiencing poverty or in crisis. We address emerging and urgent legal needs with comprehensive free legal services, impact litigation, policy advocacy, and community education through numerous legal units within the organization. Specifically, our Immigration Protection Unit represents a subset of this population facing a variety of legal obstacles related to immigration. We appreciate the opportunity to testify to the council to today on the critical issue of combating immigration fraud, as the victim of this practice are amongst the most marginalized members of society. Immigration processes and agencies are torturous and expensive for immigrants and their families to navigate. In light of time, I'm going to discuss one of the main examples that we wanted to bring to your attention. Sheila is one of the many New Yorkers who was defrauded by these schemes. Sheila arrived in the United States as a new undocumented immigrant from India. A family member recommended a service to her who could help her get papers. At a later Action NYC consultation with Sheila, Nilag learned that this service filed an application on her behalf for asylum. Sheila paid this notario thousands of dollars without fully understanding what she was applying for or being privy to the process. Sheila only noticed that something was awry when the notario confiscated and locked her passport and other documents and made her pay him the full amount of her fee. By the time that she realized she was being taken advantage of, it was too late and Sheila could not recover the money that she had been conned. Nyla canceled Sheila about her options and reported the abuse. Sheila was able to withdraw her asylum application but ultimately decided to return to India. She no longer had any savings. 
As an Action NYC attorney for AAAFC, how important reputable community institutions like the association can be in combating immigration services fraud. AAA has a longstanding reputation in Bay Ridge as a trusted community center, and we have many examples of um, immigration services fraud and how to combat them, especially by partnering with the DCWP, and we applaud their services and, their, and the council for, um, for bringing attention to the issue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair, did you want, want wish to say anything? Oh, no, I just want to say thank you again. And um, I, I I don't know if these, this, this is time for, are we going to do a whole full panel and then questions? Um, we normally do them after each panelists, but uh, we can. Uh, okay, got it. So then we okay? just answer this question. Yeah. Uh, the, the case that you just brought up and the, I know you've been listening to the conversation that we've been having with the city agencies uh, what what are you what are you recommending as someone who is intimately involved in casework around the city's approach to solving fraudulent uh, notario style interactions with our immigrant community? So I see resilience as as a goal that we should strive towards because too often policies are reactionary. It happens after people have been defrauded, and there's not enough to bring awareness before the fact. So I feel like awareness in the community is really, it's really large. And honestly, actually working with the Action NYC project has been eye-opening in a lot of ways because the Arab American Association, for example, um, we have a variety of Arabic speakers in many dialects of Arabic. Um, we have a variety of languages, you know, other than Arabic. And being able to have access to those services, that that's been a huge game changer for the community in Bay Ridge. Um, but I, I do think that more policies that focus on resilience, I think that's key. And resilience is, is preventative uh, measures and uh, things that can happen to remove someone getting caught up in fraud. And, and I wonder, does, do you feel like there's capacity within the system, like an Arab American Association right now to take on some of that work? Or is the city really needing to put more resources? Is this is something that our nonprofits can do right now without any new resources? So in terms of resources, we do have, we have a few resources available to us. So we have legal resources. Um, for example, when we hear of instances of immigration services fraud, we can sometimes help immigrants to um, get U visas, which you know, protect them. Um, moving forward in prosecuting these crimes. Um, but there's also, you know, in terms of other resources, there's a hotline that immigrants have where they can call and we can help in that process. But nonprofits, you know, we, we do what we can and there's always room for more resources. I'm never gonna say no to more funding, more capacity, more staff. I think all of those are needed, but I, I, and I think it should start with nonprofits, but there's always room for more resources. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand that the question was a little leading, so I apologize for that. But <laughs> it, it was an it's an opportunity to to talk about that part too because it's real. And city agencies, I'm hearing just this last panel from Matt Moya and DCWP, really rely on on the nonprofit sector to do this work. So we should measure the capacity and and if we're gonna be asking organizations to do more prep work for application stuff, because that's what is, but we don't even know, we have a data measurement problem right now, but um, that could be helpful in this whole thing. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Next, we'll be inviting Chioma Asi to testify and then Ulysses Noboa. Chioma? Time starts now. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Choma Azi, and I am the National Legal Director at African Communities Together, a community-based nonprofit organization that advocates for African immigrant, uh, civil, immigration, and housing rights, while also providing services uh, to support and empower immigrants um, to be dynam dynamic members of their communities. 
I'm very grateful to be present here today virtually to discuss ways uh, that we can combat immigration fraud, immigration services fraud. On behalf of our entire staff, I extend our uh, sincere appreciation for this opportunity to discuss this very, very important issue. Uh, I've been practicing immigration, I've been a practicing immigration attorney for more than a decade. And over the years, I've seen dozens of individuals, probably more than that, who have been duped and exploited by licensed attorneys, as well as those masquerading as knowledgeable professionals. Immigrants, as we all know, are highly vulnerable to immigration fraud due to the simple fact that they have less, less knowledge about or access to, or the resources um, to, to access reliable information, let alone competent legal assistance. Whether it's a language barrier, a lack of sal a solid community or family support, or just trusting the wrong person, too often immigrants are falling victim to unscrupulous people who defraud them out of thousands of dollars. Um, immigrants are also highly vulnerable, as we know, due to the sensitive nature of immigration status and the natural desperation that comes with trying to make a better life um, in a country that is not one's native home. Uh, they're also highly, they're also vulnerable to the naturally high costs associated and with obtaining and maintaining documented status in the United States. Um, and this allows uh, con artists to charge exorbitant fees with minimum questions from immigrants. While national and local conversations on immigration fraud tend to focus on immigrant communities from predominantly Spanish speaking countries and so-called notar notario fraud, um, African immigrant communities also face their own culturally specific immigration fraud concerns that I'd like to highlight today. Um, one clear example is the fraud that occurs by way of uh, religious institutions. Most African communities, religious institutions play a very central role in the community. Um, they're a gathering point and they're a source of social, cultural, and emotional fellowship. Um, and while generally they are, they play a very positive role in our community, they're also a very easy source um, for fraudsters to choose victims. These uh, fraudsters shield themselves under the goodwill of uh, these institutions when their true intent is to exploit immigrants. Um, these folks sometimes present themselves as highly knowledgeable or even sometimes falsely claim to be attorneys as I have seen in, in a few cases. Um, another common source of immigration fraud in the African immigrant community comes from community members themselves who present themselves as- fired. Oh, Looks like I lost time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I have a question. Yes, please. The, uh, th thank you for bringing up the African community, uh, immigrant community. You know, we have so many blind spots, I think, and I think you really can hit it in your testimony. Is there something you haven't said in your testimony or I, th you're, you, I think you're submitting your full testimony, but give us a sense about what the uh, what I'm going to call the blind spot, because this is an assumption I'm making with the African community, what that looks like, what that feels like in relationship to fraud, and any recommendations that you'd like the council and the agencies who are still here, uh, what we should hear from you directly. We've touched on some of them today, but I think one of the big blind spots is language, language access. Um, when we're talking about um, the information that's uh, disseminated to the community, most of those, most of those, most of that information is not disseminated in, in languages that are spoken by African immigrants. Um, they're just, they're just not even considered. So I think that's one big blind spot. I think one big challenge that our community faces is um, we do have a, we do have a good number of folks who do seek assistance from licensed attorneys. And so there's a whole unique aspect of fraud that can go on with our, with licensed attorneys. Um, so just to give a very brief example, there's a rumor that's, that is highly popular in the African immigrant community that you can get uh, documentation after being here undocumented for 10 years. And, mm. and this rumor really is coming from practitioners who tell people that you can get working status if you've been here for 10 years and it, and it circulates. And it's insidious because um, this is being spread by people who are licensed to practice and in some cases, people are getting stat they're getting the ability to work, but it's it's being it's a false it's a completely false uh, it's, a, it's a misrepresentation of the actual benefit, if you can call it that. Um, so I think uh, definitely I'm glad you mentioned the blind spot because I think again when we're talking about 
these types of issues. The African communities is often forgotten. And we're a very, it's a very diverse community. You're talking hundreds of languages across 54 countries. Um, so I think uh, it's important to just, you know, really keep in mind that there's there's a very wide spectrum of folks that are um, that that are also being defrauded. And a quick follow up to that uh, before we hand it over to Councilmember Chin, the um, define what you mean by language access, and just just define it for me and for the committee. The committee. It's just it's simply any information disseminated by by local government stakeholders in an, in a language is that that our community can read or hear because not everyone's literate. So we're also talking about if we're talking about culturally sensitive media, which someone mentioned earlier, radio programming in languages that are spoken by our community. Um, you know, print, you know, also traditional sources of media. Not everyone has is social media, you know, savvy. So some folks are getting maybe from WhatsApp, but basically information that they can consume, whether it's reading or hearing in a language that they are familiar and comfortable with. I'll pause here uh, and if we can hand it over to Councilmember Chen. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I was also gonna ask about the language access uh, question. I know that there's so many different um, languages that you say, you know, so many different uh, countries. Are you, do you know, are you connected with the mayor's office of immigrant affair or do you know the group that you work with are connected so that they know about, you know, the different languages and, and organization that they should be contacting with? Uh, Chioma? Oh, someone should unmute. Oh, yes, we are, we are. Yes, um, yeah, we are connected. Um, and interestingly enough, I, a colleague of mine uh, recently testified um, uh, and had some had an opportunity to to interact with the deputy mayor. But um, it's a, it seems to be a challenge that we're not able to. We've had a, we've had struggles to really make it clear that there's a there's a wide variety of uh, languages that we we need our community to to uh, be heard on. We, the initiatives that we have taken is we, we have a, a pool of uh, interpreters um, that provide access for not only our community members, but other partners if they need, um, if they're working with African immigrant um, service seekers, uh, we're able to provide uh, interpreters who can provide access for them. Um, but I just think there, there is a blind spot. I, I really do believe that's a blind spot because we've, it's something that we have, we've been in discussion with. So we, we look forward and we hope that we can have a uh, more extensive conversation on this, on this issue. Have you ever, have you applied for funding through the council or through the, the mayor's office of immigrant affair? Well, we, we do have action NYC contracts, um, mm -hmm. So we, you know, we do, we, we are engaged in, um, we, we, you know, we are definitely getting funding through, through the, through the city. Um, I actually have to confess, I'm new to the organization, so I can't speak to all of our, every single funding stream, but I know uh, one of our largest funding streams is through Action NYC grants. Um, and I also know we have had ongoing conversations about uh, language access amongst other things when it comes to our community. Yeah, I think I really urge you to contact, um, you know, your organization to contact the city council, the council representative, because there are funding sources that support language access and other programs. And I'm not that familiar with your group. So that's why I'm asking, you know, there are other, there are other African American groups that we have worked with, uh, but definitely should, it's a funding resource and that could really help. Thank you. Chair Ayala, do you have any, any questions? Um, and if not, then I, th do we have another panelist? I don't think so, but I'll say now if anyone, if you have missed anyone, please uh, raise your hand on Zoom now and you'll be called on in the order that your hand was raised, just in case we missed anybody.
Okay, seeing no hands raised, you may proceed, Chair, with your closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the, the members of the council and my co-chair, uh, especially Councilmember Chin, uh, for, for your amazing questions. And I think we've revealed some ideas for legislation that are either council and state. Um, and Chair Ayala for, for joining uh, in, in this conversation to really bring both of these agencies uh, to, to account. I think my, my, final, my final thoughts about what, what I've heard today is that we're really lacking in information uh, that can tell us in real time what's coming in in terms of fraud. And that's concerning for a lot of different reasons. But I believe that we can kind of solve those things by inserting new ways of capturing data. Since we, since we are dedicated to a sanctuary city, we cannot take immigrant immigrant status at all, but we can take language. And that we know is a barrier to services. Uh, we know that there could be a barrier to immigrants who are trying to reach out about fraud. Uh, they may not pick up the phone and call a government agency uh, because of their lack of trust with government right now. We're still rebuilding that after four years of terror with the previous president. And, um, and we're also seeing that there could be a capacity issue if nonprofits like the Arab American Association and other organizations that are doing legal services to take on things like the excluded worker fund, uh, which was paid for by the state, but was uh, slow to get out into the world so that so that the nonprofits could could speed up and get ready, uh, causing some of us in our city council offices to take on the application support, which is a lot of work, um, but we were ready to do that. Uh, that's all I think part of what is this blind spot that the city can really focus on. And I think that we're gonna be following up with the city agencies to ensure that they get us a better sense about how they're capturing, how they're understanding their accountability their, their process and roles and resourcing our, our community organizations, ethnic media, et cetera. So um, I'm thankful for this conversation and um, I'll hand it over to the community council for Chair Ayala or Chair, oh, to Chair Ayala. Yeah, I, I didn't have, you know, much more to add than that, but I think that, you know, it's, it was a good hearing and I thank you for um, bringing it to our attention. I think that if, if anything, we were able to identify several, you know, gaps in services. And I think that that'll be helpful in kind of outlining, right, what, what this, how our proactiveness looks like, in the, you know, in the coming years so that we're better prepared and, um, and ahead of the issues in a way that is really uh, helpful to our immigrant and most vulnerable communities. So thank you, Chair. Thank you to all of uh, to the different agencies and, and the panelists for coming today. And of course, Margaret, we love you. <laughs> love you, Margaret. And thank you, Carlos Bucayo, uh, for, for being here too. I see you on the camera. Uh, we call this hearing adjourned.